Hi and welcome everyone to today's UNU Wider Research Webinar. Um, my name is Simone Schotte and I am a research associate here at UNU Wider and I'm very pleased to share today's session. Um, as some of you may be joining us for the first time today, just a few words about who we are. So we are the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research and we strive to provide economic analyses and policy advice um, with the aim of promoting sustainable and equitable development for all. Uh, with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, um, this has meant reorienting our research focus and changing how we facilitate knowledge exchange. So as part of this process, we are very pleased to have launched this webinar series featuring eminent researchers and development specialists who present the most recent insights on how COVID-19 is changing global development and the economic and social impacts on the livelihoods of people in the Global South. Um, today's topic on COVID-19, on how COVID-19 has affected workers in the gig economy worldwide and in the Global South specifically, actually provides a very nice and fitting addition to UNU Wider's own research um, where we continue to investigate how the pandemic and the government response measures have affected the livelihoods of workers in wage and self-employment and in different types of both formal and informal work. Um, so today we are going to be looking at a very specific group of workers who are kind of in an intermediate position and yet very vulnerable. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce to you our today's speakers. Um, our main presenter today will be Funda Ustex Builder, who is a postdoctoral researcher and project manager at the Fairback Foundation, Action, Action Research Project at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, Funda's background is in sociology with thematic focuses on labor, migration, and gender. Her current work at the Fairback Project explores and aims to improve the pay and working conditions of platform workers around the world. So today she will introduce the Fairwork Foundation's work and the fairness ratings for digital labor platforms that they have developed. Um, she will also discuss the findings of the Foundation's COVID-19 research, for which they have interviewed nearly 200 platforms in more than 40 countries, of the, ma the majority of which are located in the Global South. Her presentation will be followed by Arturo Ariagada's talk on the platform economy in Chile, and the impact of COVID-19 on the workers in Latin America. Arturo is a principal investigator for the Fairwax project in Chile. He is Associate Professor of Communications at the Uni Universidad Adolfo Ibanez, where he conducts research on the intersection of media, technology, and society. He is also the Director of Social Media Culture, a research laboratory based at the School of Communications and journalism that studies the role of social media and platforms in social and economic life. So before I turn the microphone over to Funda, just a few words on how today's seminar is going to work. Um, so we will first listen to both Funda's Natura's presentations and we'll then have time to discuss together. Uh, for this purpose, I invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens. You can submit your questions at any time and I will collect them and then read them out at the end of the presentations. Um, Funda has also prepared a couple of polls for you and I invite you to participate in these. Um, and then at the end, please note that the webinar will be recorded and shared on the UNU Widers YouTube channel in the next days. So let me stop here and turn the microphone over to Funda. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hi everyone, and um, thanks for joining us today on this webinar. Um, it's really great to have you all. Uh, my name is Fundo Steck, and uh, I work at the Fair Work uh, Foundation based at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, we've been researching working conditions in the global gig economy over uh, the past several years. And, um, my presentation today includes a bit of introduction to what we do at Fair Work and also our most recent report, which came out uh, fresh out the oven last week um, um, on, on COVID-19. Um, to start us with, uh, I prepared two questions. Um, so please answer the poll. 
Um, so the first one is, how has your use of platforms changed during the pandemic? Um, it has increased, it has decreased, or it has not changed. And the second question is, how has your tipping of gig workers changed during the pandemic? It has increased, it has decreased, it has not changed. It's very exciting to watch this, <laughs> see the numbers rolling. <laughs> okay, so the results are already in. Um, the majority said to the first question that um, their use of platforms increased during the pandemic. Um, this is, I guess, expected, but um, still this is an overwhelming majority. 58% said, said this. Um, only a 13% said it has decreased and 29% um, of the uh, participants today said it has not changed. And for the second question, a uh, majority of people said their tipping has not changed during the pandemic, 53%, although a close second is um, um, those who said it has increased by 42%. All right, thank you. So I, um, um, so my, the, the uh, the title of my presentation today is looking after looking ahead after COVID-19 fair work in the gig economy but first I would like to discuss what we mean by fair work. The gig economy or platform economy as it's sometimes called is um, we refer to the economic transactions that are happening through via and on digital platforms. We can distinguish between digital platforms that enable people to sell commodities such as Airbnb or eBay and those where people can sell their labor. And at Fair Work, um, we focus on the second group of platforms. And examples include um, uh, multinational platforms such as Uber and Deliveroo. And uh, among the digital platforms, we make a further sort of uh, differentiation between cloud work and geographically, geographically tethered platform work. Um, and this means that cloud work platforms such as Amazon Turk or Upwork, where the work can in theory be done from anywhere in the world and geogra geographically tethered uh, platform work where the work is done in a particular location and the workers need to be in the place where the consumers or the clients are. Um, in terms of the scale of the platform economy, there are varied estimates and no one actually knows how big it is. Um, we are recently working on a working paper to estimate the size um, and uh, because of the uncertainty of the numbers, the estimates range between 11 million to uh, to 444, uh, 440 million at the moment. And uh, we have uh, we, we are uh, using a variety of studies for this estimation and as you will see from this slide as well, um, the, the numbers are vastly different, but it is predicted that by 2025, one third of all labor transactions will be mediated by digital platforms. And this prediction was made pre-COVID. Um, it's only likely to, to increase further um, after our current um, situation. Um, the way the gig, gig work model works is that instead of an employment relationship, the platform presents itself as a simple intermediary between the consumer and the worker. What this means is that um, they do not officially employ the worker and treat the worker as essentially an independent business. Irrespective of whether the classification is legitimate or not though, the point is that workers are not protected by the rights that they would have if they were employees. Um, and this, this creates a range of issues. 
gig work is by definition uh, precarious and insecure and carries a lot of risks. It's often unsafe. In most cases, there is an oversupply of uh, labor power, which leads to uh, financial vulnerability, and there is low pay. Um, sometimes uh, workers are paid below the minimum wages. And some workers experience explicit discrimination and some, some experience wage theft. And because of their um, employment um, status, they're often unable to um, um, make cases, um, legal cases against the platforms. And um, there is an inability to collectively organize and bargain. At Fair Work, we have a range of uh, different activities. The first one is to co-develop a set of Fair Work principles with the people and organizations that they impact on workers and platforms. The second is carrying out, of research, carrying out research to evaluate platforms against the principles, the Fair Work principles. And third, we use our research to give every major platform in all the countries uh, where we are present um, a fairness score. Um, and this is a score out of 10. The plan is to start assessing um, geographically tethered platforms, but we are actually now also assessing cloud work platforms. And our ultimate aim is to, to use these scores to change the working conditions. Fair Work is now operational in India, South Africa, Germany, UK, Indonesia, Chile, and Ecuador. And in 2021, we will be uh, further expanding to Bangladesh, Brazil, Egypt, Hong Kong, Pakistan, Ghana, and Ukraine. Um, to give a brief description of our current principles, um, which make essentially, uh, which determine essentially what we mean by fair work. Um, the first one is fair pay. So paying at least minimum wage in the worker's jurisdiction after taking account of work-related costs. The second is fair conditions, uh, which, is inten which intends to protect the worker's health and well-being. Um, the third one is fair contracts, um, which aims to ensure at a minimum following national law and having a clear contract for the workers, um, but also not engaging in the um, direct misclass misclassification of workers. The fourth one is fair management. This means having an appeals process for disciplinary uh, procedures and policies that ensure equality in the ways workers are managed. And finally, fair representation. This means having a process through which worker voice can be expressed and recognizing collective bodies like unions where they exist. Um, so if you would like to have a detailed look into our principles, um, if you go to fair.work, that's our website and all our reports and uh, principles are there. And uh, you would then see that we actually have different principles, even though the overall uh, five principles are the same. We have different principles, specific principles for geographically tethered work and cloud work. So moving on um, to our COVID report, can we have um, our third question for the poll? So the third question for the poll is, do you think the policies platforms rolled out during the pandemic are, oh, sorry. Sorry, that's my uh, editing error there. Are the responsibility of, uh, I'm so sorry, I've made an error there. The that's correct okay. question, of course. Um, my apologies, I've got it. Perhaps I'll just stop this and I'll edit and we can share again in just a moment. Sorry. That's okay. No problem. No problem at all. <laughs> so it's okay. I will just go to my next slide and uh, whenever you're ready, we can do it. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, I will introduce our COVID-19 report. Um, we released our first uh, COVID-19 report in April 2020 and um, covered 120 platforms across 23 countries in Europe, North America, South America, Asia and Africa. 
Um, after this report was released, um, we received an overwhelming response, um, positive response uh, from, every, uh, from uh, people who interviewed us, who responded to our report, and uh, we applied for some further funding from the University of Oxford, and that allowed us to continue our research up until the end of August. And as of September 2020, our second report covered 191 platforms in 43 countries across Europe, North America, South America, Asia, and Africa. And in this second report, uh, we increased the number of countries that we represented in the global south and particularly looked at the differences between how multinational platforms and the local or regional platforms were responding to the crisis. Um, the report is organized um, by the um, um, according to the five framework principles, which I just uh, presented, and uh, uses these to rate the platforms against decent work um, standards. Um, I've got the so, poll now, if you like. All right, let's Sorry. do that. Let's okay. Do that <laughs> So the, the third question for the poll is, in your opinion, whose responsibility is it to provide financial help to workers during the pandemic? Is it the governments? Is it the platforms, the unions, gig workers themselves, or you don't have an opinion? It would be very interesting to sort of cross tabulate this with uh, where you work as well. Maybe in the discussion, we can discuss further. Okay. Um, according to the results, 56% of the respondents said it's the government's responsibility and nearly 40 said it's the platform's responsibility. And 4% said um, no opinion and 2%, only one person said it's the union's responsibility. All right, let's go to the details of um, our findings. Um, so our findings indicated that um, by far the most important issue for workers was uh, fair pay, yet 10% of the platforms we surveyed, um, so around 19 of them out of 191, um, provided pay loss compensation to their workers. Platforms instead um, re uh, resorted to um, or, or resorted to expanding their operations or increasing the number of jobs available on, uh, on their platforms. But um, they also deflected responsibility to governments in order to avoid future liabilities. Um, with fair conditions, we actually divide it into two. One of them is about preventing the workers from getting ill. And the second one is uh, what the platforms did if the workers got ill. So in terms of prevention, contactless delivery was by far the most um, widespread policy that we found in this category. But um, contactless um, delivery is not always possible for, for all workers. and um, its hygiene guidance and personal protective equipment um, was not always available for, for the workers. In terms of the um, um, illness related measurements, around half of the platforms were providing some payment for the workers who were ill, but uh, when the government financial relief packages were extended to include gig workers, some platforms shifted their focus on assisting the workers to assess these schemes instead. Um, however, the accessibility of these policies remains um, unknown um, to the extent that we do not necessarily know whether they were easily accessible or hard to access. Um, with fair contracts and fair representation, we did not necessarily fi find any positive uh, policy despite growing worker um, action, but we have identified a couple of platforms which asked their workers to undersign that if they received sick leave uh, payments or, um, or any kind of financial compensation from the platforms during the pandemic, this would not alter their uh, terms of work, which means that they would not necessarily, these are not employment benefits, these 
these are one-off um, um, benefits provided by the platforms. And uh, with fair management, only a few platforms guaranteed no loss of earnings, uh, no, uh, no loss of ratings, incentives, or any uh, other kind of um, uh, achieved status at the platforms, despite the fact that um, there is an ongoing uh, low levels of work and some, uh, some workers were unable to work for longer periods of time on the platforms. And a couple of platforms pledged to anti-discrimination policies, uh, which, meant, uh, which is because um, during COVID, uh, we also receive, um, have identified discrimination against particular groups of gig workers uh, increasing, um, either because of their background or because of their susceptibility to, to the virus. If you uh, find our report online, uh, you will see we have organized the platform um, responses in a policy table. And we have grouped the platforms we surveyed according to the countries where we found them. And you will see that from uh, Morocco, Tunisia, to Nigeria, Kenya, um, Ghana. Ghana, sorry, Ghana and Brazil. We have um, surveyed a variety of countries, 43 to be exact, and, uh, and in some of them you will identify that um, some platforms were surveyed multiple times in different countries, yet the, um, the, their policies that they rolled out are different from um, country to country, even when they might be multinational platforms. So what did we find? Um, this can be organized across um, five headings. The first one is that there is a definitely a gap between rhetoric and reality. Um, what, what, what platforms say they're providing for their workers do not necessarily reflect um, what workers can realistically and feasibly access in terms of the policies. Um, we found a skew in stakeholder focus and what we mean by this is that platform responses to a large extent have targeted shareholders, investors and customers before workers. So um, contactless delivery, for instance, protects, even though it protects the workers to an extent, it protects the customers more. Um, we also, especially in the second report, when we were working on the second report, we have identified that there has been an increasing surveillance uh, measurements and surveillance related policies being rolled out by the platforms, which conflate surveillance with um, health and safety. So um, in some platforms, for instance, uh, required workers to uh, share their um, temperature scans or temperatures or uh, require them to require them to send their selfies took their pictures when they're waiting in line uh, without their consent uh, so these kind of data related issues have increased um, especially in the global south we also identified a widening gap between different types of platforms. So large platforms, uh, mainly the multinational platforms, have been able to set aside larger funds for COVID-19 health and safety measures than, than smaller ones, understandably. So, um, and also they have been able to um, more nimbly switch to new markets and diversify their portfolios teaming up with other platforms and companies, whereas smaller platforms, more local platforms, faced greater uncertain, financial uncertainty, which uh, restricted their abilities to um, roll out more encompassing policies for their workers. And um, finally, um, we have identified a gap between needs of the workers and the policies that were rolled out. Um, and a lack of alignment because um, work, what, what workers require in order to stay safe, and this includes uh, being also free from, uh, being free from infection, but also um, free from financial destitution. Um, it's not necessarily been on the same level as what the workers need, but what they could, uh, what they were uh, able to access. So in the report, we provide um, actions that the platforms can um, 
roll out specific sort of policy recommendations for fair pay, for fair conditions, and fair contracts and fair management. Um, but being aware of my time, I'm going to uh, conclude my talk here. And, uh, but I'm happy to discuss these recommendations for both the platforms and the governments after my talk. And um, we have one more um, poll question, which I will finish with. So the, the last question is, um, you have seen, um, or you can see in this table as well, um, that there ha the platforms provided a range of policies uh, to protect their workers against um, the, the risks during the pandemic. But do you think these policies um, are likely to stay after the pandemic or likely to be rolled back once the pandemic subsides? So an overwhelming majority says that they're likely to be rolled back once the pandemic subsides. All right, on that note, I will um, finish my talk here, but I'm happy to discuss this further um, after, after Arturo's presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Funder, for this very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. I already see some questions coming in through the Q&A, but feel free to continue to submit your questions. And yeah, I'm now going to hand over to Arturo for his presentation on Chile. How are you? Thanks for inviting me to discuss and present our, our work and with Funda uh, here in this, in this online seminar. Uh, my name is Arturo Arriagada. I'm an associate professor at the School of Communication and Journalism uh, at uh, Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez in Chile. Uh, and I am the principal investigator of Fair Work uh, in Chile. And I would like to present some of our um, results doing our research in Chile about uh, gig work and uh, some of the context and the, the, the challenges workers are facing uh, during COVID. General background of the gig economy in Chile. Um, as Funda mentioned before, uh, we don't have a clear estimate of gig workers in the country. Um, according to media, media reports, there are approximately uh, 15 thousand app delivery workers in the country and 200,000 uh, ride hailing workers. Um, but there are not uh, official numbers, no? Um, the economic eff effects of the pandemic in the country has increased the number of people who uh, become part of the gig economy. Um, in the period between May and July in, in 2020, the unemployment rate nationally reached uh, 13%. Um, so in that context, uh, again, uh, media articles titled as historic, the increase in the number of delivery workings, uh, workers. Uh, in some cases, those numbers reaches almost uh, 80% in the case of hit rating apps. Um, so we are facing a, a, a moment where lots of people, uh, unemployed people, um, wants to be part of this economy in the country. No? Uh, from users' perspective, um, the majority of Chileans, according to a national survey in, in 2018, um, used at least once a year different apps, uh, mostly, of course, apps like Uber, uh, but also grocery shopping apps uh, are the most used by Chileans. No? Um, an interesting date, um, number of that survey is related to um, the lack of regulation. 65% uh, of respondents consider the lack of regulation as an inconvenient for the prosperity of this market. Data about um, 
drivers is the most um, common type of data we can we can find. Um, as I said before, uh, there is an estimated of 200,000 app-based drivers in Chile, um, and according to a to to a study published uh, last year, um, those workers value flexibility, but uh, they declare very long working hours, um, and 30% of drivers operating more than 50 hours per week, and 30% of drivers more than 20 hours per day. The COVID-19 experience for gig workers have been, uh, uh, unfortunately, but uh, uh, likely as well for workers, a good opportunity to make visible their demands. Um, we wrote an article with my colleagues, Macarena Bonom and Francisco Ibáñez, uh, commenting some of the, the issues workers considering the most relevant during uh, the pandemic, no? Um, they feel unprotected. Uh, they are not always receiving uh, protection from uh, platforms. Um, and also they are at the front line um, of um, providing services, no? Uh, and their labor still has uh, no recognition legally. Um, it is interesting that this year, three strikes took place in April, in July, and August, um, led by food delivery workers. Uh, their demands were in relation to fair payment, considering that some apps during uh, the pandemic changed their, uh, their, their fees. No? Um, and also, they were demanding the provision of protective equipment, uh, masks, uh, alcohol, etc. In terms of the regulatory framework and recent uh, policy developments, there's, I mean, the most comprehensive bill so far was presented uh, last, uh, last year by two members of Congress from the left wing coalition Frente Amplio. Um, by classifying platform workers as, as employees, the bill intends to provide them with a range of rights. Uh, for instance, working time and times for rest, transparency in subjects uh, such as uh, decision making, data collection and scoring, um, and the bill creates a new form uh, of employment contracts, a uh, contract within the labor code, uh, recognizing the specific characteristics of the platform economy's working arrangements. Um, today, um, up workers are considered uh, as independent contractors. No? Um, in terms of our research, um, last year um, we had a, a workshop with workers, with associations of workers, uh, platform executives, and our research team, the people from Oxford and people from um, our team in Santiago. And during the end of last year and until May uh, 2020, um, we did 38 interviews with workers from different platforms. Now we are at the stage of um, scoring um, the, the platforms and looking forward to receive uh, information from, from them to um, use it as evidence to improve their scores um, based on the fair work methodology, the one that Funda uh, described it before. Um, we have initial meetings, um, we are waiting for the response, and um, then we will share publicly our um, scores uh, and the, the uh, interviews we made. No? In terms of our findings, we've been interviewing mostly full-time workers. Um, and of course, there are different um, demands and, and, and for instance, drivers are worried about uh, inspectors and the lack of regulations uh, 
because they are working legally. Um, but in the case of shoppers and riders, uh, they are worried for the lack of protection, especially during COVID. Um, they need um, more uh, presence and, and help from uh, platforms um, for healthy uh, issues. No? In terms of potential topics for, for further development in relation to our research, we found three interesting um, topics. No? The first one is related with um, uh, focusing on migrants and their activities. Uh, they are uh, illegal workers, but also gig workers. They have a double identity, you know, undocumented on the one hand, and on the other hand, they are illegal workers. Um, also, the role of informal online groups to share information with, with peers. It is interesting how different workers um, connect to each other uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on WhatsApp groups, um, sharing information, um, about uh, their working conditions, about how to um, do their activities uh, in, in a safe way. Um, and also it is interesting to, to explore in detail the role that uh, spaces like, for instance, public spaces outside the restaurants are um, places where workers have um, the possibility to share uh, with each other. No? considering they're, they're, they're suffer lots of uh, isolation. Uh, they don't have too much possibilities to share with other people, no? Um, and another topic is related with the role of algorithms, especially in relation to privacy issues and the organization of labor. Um, further issues to, to, to pay attention, we are facing an economic recession in the country and we don't know how the gig economy will be affected. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, if, if this will increase the number of gig workers in the country. Um, I am also, there's no public data about their working conditions. Um, we need more data, ideally national data about gig workers in the country. Um, but also there is an opportunity considering the strikes, considering um, uh, the coverage these issues gain in the media, um, there is an opportunity to talk about the, the gig economy publicly. You know? Workers' protests are gaining media attention, so we have the possibility to discuss about the impact of the gig economy in the country and in the, the working condition of, uh, of these people. You know? So that's my presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. So looking forward for your questions and comments. Great. Thank you very much, Funda and Arturo, for your presentations. I'm um, going to start trying to combine a few of the questions that have been coming in through the Q&I chat function. And a lot of these circle around the question of policy recommendations and how can social protection be provided to gig workers. So among them, Ricardo Santos, who's a research fellow at UNI Wider, he works in Mozambique and also witnessed their kind of shift towards more and more gig economy workers, especially in urban areas. And his question is, what can we learn from the middle income countries that you have been studying, those of you? And in particular, does a level of workers protection and of decent work in countries offer a good benchmark for what effect the gig economy has? And considering the evidence that you have, um, what may be the risk to what workers that can we like can we export those models of policy options that you have seen in the middle income countries working or not working? Can those be kind of exported to other countries? Or what are good lessons to be learned from these? Um, and let me combine this with a question of what are kind of the incentives for the platforms themselves to introduce better contracts or to offer this type of social protection to their workers? Like can it be combined with the traditional business model, say, of the gig economy? Thank you. Um, Do you want to go first? All right, I will go first. Um, sorry. 
Um, thank you very much for these questions. Um, these are really, really um, very sort of uh, questions. These are questions that go to the uh, core of um, our research at Fair Work. And in this um, COVID report, we try to include also um, low income countries as well. Um, as, as much as possible. But of course, um, we could do this only within our capacity of, uh, you know, language skills, as well as uh, the, the kind of information that was available online for, for the platforms. Um, even though we have also reached out to platforms to um, share any evidence they might have with us for this specific report. Um, what are the... Um, um, so you uh, Ricardo Santos, you're asking what can we learn from middle income countries? Um, there are many things to learn um, in terms of uh, things that can be done, but also uh, parts to be avoided. And um, this is why we are sort of in, in at Fair Work, we are um, supporting uh, five Fair Work principles, um, which are a kind of standard for establishing fair gig economy across the world. But at the same time, if you um, look further into our methodology and the specific thresholds of those principles, they are very adaptable for local contexts. And uh, we understand that especially uh, the differences between different sectors and different, um, in the different countries and different groups of workers, um, it's difficult to come up with with um, a, a, um, a sort of a, a fair work standard that's, that's going to be one size fits all. Um, the things to watch out for perhaps is to, you know, consider, you know, you're asking whether um, the effects of gig, gig economy in further hindering workers' conditions in high income countries. What are the risks towards workers of the export of these solutions to low income countries? There are so many risks. Um, and these risks are really difficult to sort of uh, list one by one now. But I can, in general, um, sort of say that the risks are gener um, related to workers' health and well being, and this includes both physical and mental uh, well-being for working on, on these platforms, um, but also uh, their contractual rights, whether they're able to um, raise an issue in the courts or uh, whether they can uh, seek legal representation if they have a grievance um, and um, whether there is any accountability on the side of the platforms um, when something goes wrong um, for, for the workers. Um, these, I'm, I'm happy to sort of, you know, um, answer these questions further in, in detail because there were so many, but I think I should give the floor to Arturo now as well. <laughs> Okay, but you can you can continue if you want, Funda. But <laughs> let me one 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 short comment. I think uh, at this stage, um, at least in Chile, considering Chile as a um, mid-income country, no, um, uh, independently of the inequality within the country, but. Um, there are issues of visibility in terms of uh, uh, it is especially in this context it is essential to have data and and the main problem today is a problem that i think gray uh, suggests on 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 his question no um the opportunities that the gig economy uh, gives to people who can't uh, work or can't find a job you know, um, in the market. Uh, and that's convenient for, for, um, for governments in some ways, you know? uh, especially when, when, when you measure unemployment um, and, and, and if these people have a source of income from platforms, they are not considered unemployed. No, um, I've been discussing this issue with different um, 
actors in the country that are involved with the uh, labor statistics. Um, and, and that's the main tension, no? No one uh, is interested yet to measure the amount of people who are working for this economy. Um, and, and national labor surveys or unemployment surveys uh, must to include those questions uh, to have a clear idea uh, about the size of this market and then uh, to, to discuss uh, regulation possibilities. You no, know? um, at this stage, I think this it's a common issue. Maybe fun that you you have a clear idea about that, but uh, it is so difficult to have um, official numbers related to the size of this market. Um, and without that, uh, it's difficult to make visible the demands of these people and the possibilities also they should uh, obtain working for. Uh, platforms and, and uh, to have to have a, a source of income. No, um, numbers are fundamental. Official numbers about the size of this market are, are, are essential. I think to continue the discussion. Maybe coming in on this point with another question, also from the chat. Like you mentioned, that for many workers. The gig economy is essentially the only option to generate an income, like especially in like high unemployment context. And um, Gray Stubford mentions the example of South Africa, where you have kind of a broad unemployment rate of about 42 percent. Um, and it has been, I think, frequently argued that especially in Africa, the future of work probably won't be growth of full-time formal sector jobs. So, and then the gig economy for some time was perceived at least as an alternative and maybe how do you see the future of this gig work in developing countries such as South Africa and has the COVID-19 pandemic been a chance or a challenge in this regard? Like, do you think that overall it's been rather improving due to their situation and due to some of the platforms implementing maybe some types of minimum social protection at least? Um, yeah, we had the question here, how do you strike a balance between still nurturing the benefits of on-demand work and achieving fair work at the same time? And what, in your opinion, are good starting points here for a country such as South Africa? Um, I think, um, so our, in our project, we believe that striking a balance is, is possible. Um, and we think that it's, um, the, the five principles of fair work we have um, would help platforms to, pro, um, to sort of strike that balance. Um, and it would also help um, platforms and the workers in the global south to escape the, the biggest um, pitfalls and the risks which we have identified um, in other countries or um, in the countries where we operate. Um, to avoid those those risks, because um, our so our principles have been developed um, through extensive research and extensive uh, discussions uh, between our country partners, as well as the ILO and um, UNCTAD, and and uh, years of research on um, informality and gig economy in general, and. Um, Although looking ahead, we can think, um, sort of, we can speculate that uh, gig economy might replace uh, or might take over some of the existing employment structures in uh, various parts of the world. And I would not necessarily limit this to the global south or lower middle income countries uh, because it's a growing um, type of work. And um, especially if we consider online digital work, um, which has substantially, um, there are sort of, you know, even though there's, like, it's, it's difficult to uh, come up with any particular statistics on this, um, it is expected that online gig work has increased during COVID because of um, um, the general lockdowns many people across the world experience. So coming back to my point about the future, um, the, 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 the way to strike the balance is to identify what are the risks now and how we can avoid them. And um, 
there, there are things to do for both platforms, for work, workers, um, for the governments, uh, as well as uh, for the consumers to be able to uh, be to be aware of what the workers are going through and what kind of risks they are being um, they're exposed to on an everyday basis is is very important. And with the fair work principles, our aim is to um, both highlight these principles and also provide ways, um, actionable points, uh, sort of steps for platforms to um, to mit mitigate these risks. Thank you for this reply. Um, maybe I told you want to also come in on this and we had a specific question about whether the results, you found different results um, in your findings from the global south versus the global north and maybe also whether the policy responses by platforms have been different. And I have been wondering whether this multinational platforms, whether they had also country specific responses or whether they were more uniform in terms of the type of measures that they have implemented. Mm -hmm. Arturo, would you like to go uh, with this one? No, no, go, go. Okay. Please. Um, so this has been a particular research topic uh, for our report actually because as you will see um, some uh, multinational platforms are operational in many of the countries that we have surveyed and it is difficult for us um, only via desk research to identify um, which of the global policies they have rolled out are actually applicable in the local context in the countries where we have surveyed them. Um, so we have uh, used a couple of different methods, um, one of them reaching out to the local platforms in the countries, um, but also any kind of worker reports and um, um, information that we could find online um, or worker interviews if we could conduct them. Uh, um, to to hear whether these policies that the policy uh, that the platform said they were rolling out were actually um, available to the workers, and this is what we mean by um, sort of uh, the gap between theory and reality, because some of the um, some of the policies um, were even though they were sort of rolled out at the global level, um, our study indicated that they were not necessarily accessible by the workers um, who were in specific countries. So I think there's probably, uh, um, there is not probably, there's definitely more need to do more research on this, uh, but we definitely need to stress that, that gap between rhetoric and reality. Right, I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, some dimension that we haven't discussed a lot yet is the one of gender differences in your, like systematic gender differences in your findings, as well as in the possible policy recommendations. And we had a question saying that knowing that the digital labor market tends to replicate the gender divides of offline work, basically, what are some of the important policy interventions that you would recommend to bridge this gender gap? And we had another question on discriminations more general. I think in the report you also refer to other vulnerable groups, for example, if you want to include something on this. Um, yes, so the gender uh, question and in the report we also refer to um, discrimination in general. In fact, uh, anti-discrimination policy is one of the policies we have um, we have surveyed for this report. Um, I, I answered one other question about uh, gender, um, so I will repeat some of my answer there. So gender is definitely a very important, and gender proved to be a very important differentiating factor during the, the pandemic. Um, because um, first of all, the platforms that had to, uh, the majority of the platforms that had to halt their operations um, entirely were the platforms where a uh, majority of workers were women. And what I mean by this is that uh, platforms that provide domestic work services, care work services, um, beauty or personal grooming services, uh, the majority of workers on these platforms are women. But 
due to uh, the nature of the pandemic and the, the nature of um, the lockdowns, um, it's, it's very difficult, for instance, um, for um, these platforms to operate on a contactless delivery basis, basically, because the nature of the job doesn't allow it. Um, you'll remember that uh, in the, the, the peak of the lockdowns, for instance, visiting guests were not allowed, let alone someone coming to cut your hair um, at home. Um, but this meant that women workers were particularly um, affected during, in terms of financial vulnerability during the lockdown. But we also need to look at the particular gender um, dynamics that, that are at play here. Um, women have been, uh, women, um, a majority of women or in the larger proportion, um, they take the care responsibility at home and um, they are um, likely to take care of their children or the elderly in their families. So um, the risk of uh, catching the virus for them is really high. It, it has a um, really um, it has a really high risk uh, and this means that um, the risk of being exposed to the virus is not only a personal risk it's a fami family wide risk and even if platforms uh, although uh, a couple of platforms did this but majority of the platforms we surveyed even when they provided sick leave or any kind of healthcare related policies they did not extend these to um, the families of the workers. They gave only individual um, subsidies or um, healthcare benefits. So th this meant that women um, had to basically um, step away from gig work, um, um, especially for geographically tethered platforms, and they were um, adversely affected. And this is um, this this is something we have uh, studied. This is something we have studied in our in our study. And in terms of uh, particular policies for um, that that can target women, um, this is really difficult to just you know, come, come up with one policy, but it is important to um, stress um, the importance of financial compensation, sort of pay related relief uh, to, to women workers because um, especially during the lockdowns, there has been also increasing reports about violence against women with uh, sort of, you know, the effect of um, staying at home for longer periods with uh, their families. Um, and um, without financial independence, it's very difficult for these for the women workers to be able to establish themselves outside of the home. So um, for governments and for the platforms um, to protect the, the women workers, the, the first uh, important thing is to provide financial assistance. And the second is to extend um, pro healthcare related protection to women and their families. All right, thank you. I think we've mentioned that a lot of policy options. I think one of the remaining questions, who's going to push for these kind of like, is it mainly government regulations? Is there a role to be played by consumers? Um, I don't know to what extent is it also maybe, do you think that your report and releasing this information could help consumers make choices when using this type of platform services, for example? Um, yeah those type of questions, maybe to both of you to, to end. Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of, of uh, everything. No? I, I, we, need, we need that uh, governments um, regulate and establish a relation with platforms in terms of with what are, or which are their boundaries to, 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 um, execute the power they have today. You know? uh, they become intermediaries, new intermediaries, without being uh, regulated. You know? uh, the majority of platforms. I mean, uh, and, and, and an interesting aspect is it's not it's not only related to 
um, workers. No, uh, for instance, I'm 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 thinking of delivery workers. There are also restaurants or uh, stores or small businesses that has to deal with platforms as well, uh, paying a, a high percentage of of their um, sales you no know, for those services and and no one is taking or paying attention to that aspect as well uh, a restaurant has to pay today at least in chile uh, almost 20 percent of the final price of of a uh, uh, for a menu for instance uh, they uh, using a, a delivery app you no know, uh, for that use so that's another dimension of the gig economy, it's not only workers, it's, it's uh, restaurants or uh, small businesses that uh, has to pay a considerable amount of money. Uh, and the, the strange thing is the, 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 the one who received those benefits is the, the final consumer, no? So we have also to, to catch their attention in terms of if you want to pay less, you have to assume that you are um, feeding a, a change that are not always that's not always fair for different actors within that chain. You no know? uh, workers, uh, restaurants, business, etc. So I think it's a combination of all of that. I would um, I would agree with Arturo here. It's a it's a combination of uh, many uh, stakeholders, um, consumers, individual consumers or private consumers are definitely um, a part of this. But um, it's difficult to uh, put the whole burden on the individual um, consumers as well because. Um, especially during the pandemic, um, we are all affected by various things, family um, considerations, financial considerations. So the individual uh, uh, persons, consumers might not necessarily have the power to be able to um, um, stand up against the platforms. But we can also think about consumers as large organizations, as, as large institutions, as, um, and, um, and, and uh, definitely the platforms uh, and the governments themselves, um, who are, which are large enough uh, to be able to uh, make, a say, make a say, say something against the platforms and um, make a stand against, against them. And what I mean by this is that, um, for instance, in terms of uh, procurement, um, if your company or the institution you work for allows you to order food uh, from a delivery company, um, let's say for lunch, if these things still exist, um, that makes a difference if your institution has a thousand uh, workers, for instance, as a, a thousand employees ordering food. Um, if your institution is um, hiring transcription services from an online platform and uh, they're using um, the platform that has the lowest fair score rating, fair work score rating, for instance, um, then that has an impact. And at Fair Work, we try to sort of um, visualize this as well, and we try to be part of this discussion. It's essentially the responsibility falls on all of us um, and all the stakeholders in this discussion, but um, at various levels. Thank you so much for both your presentations and the very insightful discussion. I think we need to close here, but yeah, I think definitely can agree that the gig economy is here to stay and it's going to be interesting to follow these developments and also the fair work work. Thank you so much everybody for tuning in today and we hope to see you for our next webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.